All right, boom. Finally, we're going live. All right, sweet. Sorry about the delay. Still takes me a second to get this figured out. Um, but we are live for sure. And I'm going to move this down here. And welcome to the welcome to the night hunting podcast. This is Tony Abreu. I'm your host. And this is straight up a podcast um, straight up about night hunting for all about night hunting for night hunters. So I've done two episodes so far. And uh, this is going to be episode number three. And just want to make sure we can hear everything here. So, um, but yep. So here we go. Let me uh, get over here and share my screen real quick. Um, share screen. And boom. All right. Cool. So, yeah. So episode number three. In the first episode, we covered uh, pretty much um, my story about, you know, night hunting. And um, the last episode, man, I feel like it's been so long ago. We talked about basically what is night hunting. And right now it is February 14th, 2023. Uh, Happy Valentine's Day. So basically right now in this space um you know deer season just ended and it's still small game season um in a lot of places the coyote breeding season is coming up uh in some places like here there are definitely some breeding going on right now um you know for me a lot of right now that what's going on a lot of places that we're deer hunting right now i am working to shoot hogs and also coyotes on different leases that other people just don't have time to do and then also have a couple of places that we frequent for coyotes uh, places that have cows and then also one of my favorite times of the year coming up is deer depredation season which is basically the spring plant. And with that being said, um, you know, watermelons are starting to be, I can see the beds starting to go down everywhere, which is super cool. And, you know, hoping to get in on some, on a couple of deer tags myself. Um, But this episode, episode number three, we're going to be talking about all of the gear that is used for night hunting or that I use for night hunting. So been night hunting for a little over three years now. Uh, Try to get out once a week, sometimes even twice a week. Actually, this week I've been out twice. Uh, Last Thursday, we went out on one of the leases that I was telling you about. Actually, it's privately owned land that they deer hunt a lot and uh, lots of coyotes on that property. Uh, The coyotes were not very responsive. There's actually cows on the property too. The coyotes were not very responsive to the call, but we did end up getting one. Uh, We were driving down a narrow road with woods on both sides. And uh, I was scanning with my thermal as I was driving on my rifle, my short barrel rifle, and uh, seen one cross the road in front of us. He stopped. We stopped. Uh, didn't really get a shot on him, and uh, he went in the woods to the left. We all got off, set up our tripods, and started calling, and he came back out, and we shot him. So uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, not, you know, I'm not killing 100 every year or anything, but definitely, you know, trying to at least get better numbers every year and just really trying to help people with property and help to uh, protect property, protect livestock, protect crops stuff like that so the gear required to to night hunt well number one rifle uh rifle some people use bows 
Uh, some people use air rifles, but right now what I'm using, I have a couple different rifles. I have uh, mostly AR style. I do have a 22 Magnum that I've kind of been taking out, but mainly I'm shooting a 6.5 Grendel. I have a short barreled rifle legally uh, that I have um, that I've had for a while. It's a 12 inch barrel with a suppressor and uh, it's light, short. Um, it is hard to shoot free-handed for some reason. I have issues shooting it free-handed because it's so light and it's bouncy. But that's that's my go-to. I call that my shorty. Also, I have a <clears throat> a 16-inch um AR style 223 or 556. Um, I use that sometimes as well. And then I also have a 20-inch 6.5 Grendel with a non-adjustable stock on it. I'm going to be pulling that out here um, in the near future to put a new scope on that I just got and uh, use that. I, lo I love that one for, you know, hogs. I love the 6.5 Grendel for hogs. I'm, I'm not just a coyote hunter. I mean, I'm, I'm shooting hogs, I'm shooting deer. And, you know, I like a little bit better punch when it comes to the hogs. I, I've, I've shot a hog one time, four different times at 40 yards and finally after the fourth shot he stopped moving so they're so tough uh i mean and, and really shot placement's a big deal but you know sometimes you don't have the option of getting it right where you want it um and you definitely don't want to shoot a hog dead in the shoulder i actually did in that instance and he got up he kept falling down but he kept getting back up as well so you know rifle's going to be a big deal now Back in the beginning, before the night hunting was even legal, um, you know, most people just used a regular light, uh, spotlight, whatever, flashlight. I remember when LED lights came out, those were pretty cool. Uh, the first time I ever even, when night hunting was legal, the first thing I ever did was I had my 223 AR and I actually zip tied a small spotlight to the bottom of the barrel and uh, used that. I never shot anything with it, but I, it still was fun to take out and kind of look through the scope and light up stuff with it. Um, but, you know, a shotgun, a rifle and a one eyed dog, you know, that's the using the gun and the light. And then that's the the basic style. And And, and, and honestly, a lot of people still use lights like there's. There's people that still that's all they use. I mean, and in some places that might be all that's legal. You definitely want to. You definitely want to check your local laws. I'm going to say this every time you definitely want to check your local laws. You don't want to be out there doing something that you're not supposed to do or not supposed to be doing that's illegal. Because if you get caught, they're going to take a lot of stuff. They're going to take your truck. They're going to take your weapons. They're going to take everything. It's best just to just, you know, study your laws, know what you're doing. But then, you know, once you get past the the light, you know, then we, we're going to get to night vision or thermal. So with night vision, there's plenty of scopes out there. You know, there's digital night vision, which starts at like 500 bucks. I mean, actually, you could probably get some cheap Chinese stuff for less than 200. Uh, and a lot of people ask me how that stuff is. I actually looked through one of those one time. I didn't buy it. But I looked through one one time and it was okay at best. I mean, I'm going to say you could probably get out to 100 with it, possibly. But you're not going to get very much farther than that. Um, but generally, you know, your scopes are going to be, I mean, there's even some for 300. But generally, 500 is the starting point. And that's going to be a digital scope. Uh, you can go all the way up to, you know, thousands of dollars for actual true generation one two or three night vision which require less light uh, they pull in a lot more light naturally uh, the digital is gonna you know require a lot more infrared light and most of the scopes that you buy i would say you have basically 100 maybe 150 yards out of the lights that they provide uh, the lights are okay at best but there's a lot of aftermarket lights that can get you way out there i mean there's the first one I ever bought was a predator tactics, um, predator tactics, coyote reaper XXL 800 yards. 
no problem. And I actually have been on spots and are in on leases and actually looked at tree lines that far. Now, are you going to be able to see an animal that far? Probably not. Even with a five power scope, hard to see that far. You could definitely see eyes. I've definitely seen eyeballs at 500. And with night vision, sometimes eyeballs are the first thing you're going to see anyways. But, you know, with the infrared light, yeah, you got your scope on, but the, the actual infrared throws a small red glow. And if you're looking directly into it, you can, it's, it's a pretty big glow. Like I remember uh, being on a deer depredation hunt one time, shooting into the swamp, towards the swamp, two deer, they ran. We actually left the gun pointed that way with the light on, found the light right where it was shining, walked into the woods, found the deer. But when you look directly into that light, it was pretty dang bright especially that big. I mean, it was, a, I think, like a 50 plus millimeter lens or millimeter light um, objective that was on there. So, you know, you can definitely see it. Now, does that mean that the animal is going to see it? That depends. Um, I have definitely shined animals. I shined it. I shot a deer one time on a deer depredation permit at less than 30 yards with that same light never saw me um actually had a hard time finding it because I, I didn't know it was that close the only thing that really well it was in it was in a corn like in corn that was taller than he was um it took me a long time to find it because I thought it was farther away than it really was and then I watched the video and I'm like holy crap it was really close it was only like 30 yards but never saw the light or at least maybe he did see the light and didn't know what he was looking at and I was able to take that, take that deer. Um, as far as another place that I went to, there was a spot where we were shooting at deer at like 200 yards. And I shot it. We shot a couple at that, at that space. And then the next week we came back and I turned my light on and there was those deer were there again. And as soon as that light came on, boom, they took off. So I would imagine that they associated the light with the boom and they realized real quick that they didn't need to be there. So the infrared light is definitely there. Um, most of your night vision lights are running 850 nanometer, which is more red. And then some of your better, better lights are running 940, which is a little more purpley and a little less detectable. But an infrared light, you can't see the beam sideways, but you can see it if you're looking directly into it. And then in the, the digital night vision just totally illuminates everything. It's amazing. So that being said, the you know, the next step here is to get into thermal. And thermal is going to start. I mean, they have scopes right now that you can get in the totally budget friendly range at around a thousand bucks. But I mean, I would recommend that you not buy that unless that's all your budget is. I would say that in order to get a decent one, at least decent on a lower level, I would say spend at least 2000 and there's plenty of scopes in that range that are going to be very capable. One of the ones I'm running right now is AGM Rattler. <clears throat> it is a one and a half power scope. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, it's a one and a half power. Um, I'm used to running three power scopes, like three is more my sweet spot for the bigger fields that we hunt. But this one's one and a half power. It works really well. And thermal is just going to be like so much better. Night vision, you know, you can adjust the beam on it. And if you're farther out, you're going to want more lights if you're recording. And it's more like a tunnel vision to where thermal is just wide open. See everything, see everything you can see in the fog. Um, night vision is going to be held up by fog. Like fog is just going to illuminate and you're not going to be able to see anything but just fog. So thermal, definitely the way to go if you can afford it. 
but thermal has its drawbacks as well. You know, thermal, if you're hunting around houses and stuff, and there are actually house dogs around, sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between house dog and a coyote, especially if you don't have a lot of time actually watching coyotes move through a thermal. Sometimes it gets difficult, but thermal definitely, they can't hide. Like it's so easy to see them. And at the same time, you're not throwing a bunch of light out. The only light that's even detectable is coming out of the display side or your eyepiece. And a good, if you leave the uh, the rubber eyepiece on, you know, you can stick your eye up in there and most of the time it's going to be fine. So thermal, definitely. Um, also, if you, you know, are just getting into this, I mean, and you can only afford night vision, you know, maybe try to get a night vision scope and run a thermal monocular. You know, that'll help you at least, the monocular will help you at least detect something pretty quick. And then you can just, you know, put it in the scope and actually see if it's something you want to take. Um, right now, as far as I go, I mean, I like to use a monocular and a rifle scope. The you know, swinging around a rifle all night with a scope on it, trying to look for things is a little more exhausting than just having a small monocular in your hand and being able to just look. So, you know, definitely monocular is a cool thing. Plus, you can have a monocular on a lanyard and just kind of keep it around your neck. Um, I use monoculars to drive my golf cart, which sometimes... Most of the time where I live, you know, it's pretty illuminated, even though it's dark. There's a lot of cities around and they throw off a lot of light. Uh, the moon generally throws off. But I have been in situations where it's been super, super dark and, you know, needed the monocular just to drive. And I really don't like using lights because it just puts off too much. And I'm trying to be as stealthy as possible. So. Monoculars are cool. Um, and. and you know, if you can afford a monocular and a thermal rifle scope, definitely by all means. But if you can't, you know, like I said, a monocular is a great complement to a night vision scope. So next on the list, we're going to talk about tripods. So generally for us, uh, we keep our tripods fully extended when we get out of our main vehicle and then we throw all our gear onto the golf cart and we keep the tripod fully extended and just hang it on the golf cart on some hangers that I have. And then whenever we see something we want to call or we get to a spot we want to call, we just take the tripod down, extend the legs out or not extend them, but spread them out. Uh, I run right now a bog death grip and I like, it's basically a saddle clamp that clamps my rifle down so that it stays in the clamp and I can let it go. Sorry. I can let it go and it'll just stay there. And then if we're walking, you know, sometimes we do have to walk. I can stick my hand up underneath the actual middle of the tripod and, or I can fold the legs up and kind of hold it on my back and let the gun go straight in the air It'll hold it. I don't have to worry about it falling off. It clamps down pretty tight. But having a saddle is uh, probably my favorite option. There are other options, too, with the Arca rail. You can actually get an Arca clamp and clamp it down to a, a tripod. But Bog Death Grip is one of the main, like, entry-level tripods. And I have one of those. I also have another brand, Predator Tactics, with the Arca rail. But I bought a... A death grip saddle to put on top of it. I like the death grip or the, the original bog better. It only has two legs versus the other one has three different leg adjustments. And I like the two better. It's just easier, quicker. It is a little short sometimes and it doesn't have a ball head on it. So you, you lose a little bit of adjustability, but I don't really need all that. I just want to be light, simple, and and, and effective. So Tripods, you know, start at around $150 and go all the way up to $700 or even more. Um, some people, you know, want to spend more money and, and really, 
you know, get a sturdy one. I really have no problems shooting off of the, the bog myself. So that's kind of where I land uh, a good middle, middle of the road one. I do sell on my site, which by the way, uh, a lot of this stuff that I'm talking about here, you can find on my, on my website, which is perceptivegear.com. And, but one of the middle, middle of the road ones that I sell there is, is a, it's a cope cope Jaeger. And that's spelled kind of weird, but they were one of the original, they have a, a grip that has like rubber fingers on it called the Reaper grip. And they have a, basically a tripod there for like 400 bucks. The grip is totally worth it. It's one of the best in the industry. And then they're using a, uh, just a regular slick tripod with it. So, you know, it really depends on where you're at, but most people are buying the bogs in the entry level especially if you are, you know, just getting into this and, you know, if it's something that you want to upgrade later, you can do that for sure. So, so beyond that, you got a tripod, you got your rifle, you got your scope, whether it's night vision, thermal, or just the light. Next, you know, we're talking about calls. So originally when I first even started learning about coyote hunting in the daytime. You know, I used to watch Randy Anderson on YouTube and uh, bought a couple hand calls. I got a mouth call, just played around a little bit with it. And um, I also have a rabbit and distress call, which sounds really good. Um, I actually carry those in my car, but I never really take them with me because <laughs> it's just a lot of work. Um, I do keep a small squeaker toy in my pocket which I guess I'm going to call it a toy, but it's really like a little squeaker, mouse squeaker. A lot of times when you get coyotes that get in pretty close, you know, you can't just blast them out with a call, um, an electronic call. So, you know, using a little squeaker kind of helps to just kind of coax them in, you know, without blasting them out. Um, it's really weird though, because one time we were on a stand and this stand generally we kill one coyote here every time. Usually we see two and kill one. It's the weirdest thing, but we shot one and I left my call running and it was playing super loud. Cause I was trying to call some coyotes from across the road um, to where we were. And I left it on while we went to go get a picture of this dog that we had killed. And when we walked back, I could not believe how loud it was. And the dogs like came super close. The, the, the one dog, I actually ended up shooting him through a bush, but he was like right on the other side of the fence, like right in that call's face. And it was so loud. So, you know, you just, you just never know what they're going to do, you know, or what they're, what they're coming for. But if you sometimes, you know, being in a big field, like another time, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a hundred acre field and I put the call out and I left it running while we were driving away from it. And there was a point to where we were on the other side of the field and we couldn't even hear the call and it was turned all the way up. And then that call in particular, which is an Icotec, it was an Icotec night stalker. Uh, it has a 300 yard range for the remote and we actually you know tested that and even at 300 yards it didn't sound like it was up and it was up all the way so you know it, it depends on the night you know if it's a little bit windy sometimes you're not going to hear it as well so but i recommend you know if you have a call sometimes to just leave it on the ground and walk away from it so you can kind of see and gauge like what it sounds like because that was the first time or like the second time I've ever done that. And uh, you just kind of learn a lot from listening to it and, you know, and how far away it is and you can kind of put yourself in their shoes, but back to the calls, you know, you got a hand call, you got mouth calls, and then you got an electronic call. And I remember I had bought a small, like $150 call and it had like 24 different spots where you could put a sound on there 
and uh, never really had a lot of success with that. And then I bought uh, the Icotech Outlaw, which is their flagship model, or it was whenever they first came out. And um, it's like a $500 call, maybe 400. And then with a lithium battery, it'd be about 500. But it came with a lot of, a lot of call, a lot of sounds on it. And a lot of sounds from like one of the industry leading sound makers. And uh, th th they have that one. And then they also have the Night Stalker, which have the same. And man, the first time we had that call, we I started running that call and the, the coyotes were just busting in so hard. It was like such a game changer to run a call with such good sounds. Uh, I, I see, you know, on Facebook, a lot of people, they basically like what they do is they, you know, are wondering, you know, Hey, what kind of call to get? Or like they're trying to call them in by hand, you know, with a mouth call or whatever. I mean, just investing in good sounds has just totally been a game changer. Now, I'm not the best caller in the world. Uh, I mean, there's people out there that are really good at it. They've been doing it for a lot longer than I have. But I really enjoy even taking people and just, you know, figuring out what sounds are working and, and calling dogs in for other people. It's just a lot of fun. So when you get to that point, you know, you, you just – kind of it gets more fun and it's just really fun whenever you can like when a dog is hung up and you can just get them to come on out you know so so anyway that's the 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 call is the next thing uh let me figure out where i was all right so then after that you know on the call we load all this stuff up on the on the golf cart i keep it in a in a backpack and then generally, uh, once we're out of the backpack, I just keep it in the floorboard of the, the golf cart and I keep the, the remote in my pocket. But the next thing I want to talk about for gear is a vehicle. So some people, you know, will totally black out all the lights on the vehicles. Some people just drive the vehicle, park it and walk 100 miles. Um, me right now, I have a expedition and it's got all my junk in the back. I basically just use it for my business and then also for, uh, for hunting. And I got a, about a 12 foot trailer that I use as well. And I have an electric golf cart. It's a, it's basically a 2016, um, easy go TXT 48 volt. It's lifted just two wheel drive. But most of the stuff that we do, man, that thing is a game changer. Uh, we've snuck up on so much game with that thing. And, you know, it carries all of our gear. I just can't imagine doing what I do without a golf cart. Um, it's been total game changer. So generally we park, you know, at the first spot wherever we are. And then we get on that thing. And sometimes we're riding around on a thousand acres on that thing. So I mean, there's, there's just no way you could walk it. And if you had a vehicle with lights on, you're just, you're making so much noise. So I, I know that's part of our success. Um, the golf cart definitely is the way. My golf cart has about a 25 mile range. I have taken it on multiple occasions on like 17 mile trips just in the daytime, but at nighttime, I've only ran out of battery once or twice because I didn't charge it. Um, it always has enough to get me around. I've haven't, I haven't been on a big enough property yet to where it would wear it down. And if it did, and if I had to go a long distance in it, I would definitely put it back on the trailer and move that way. So, but it has ran out. It actually ran out a couple of weeks ago. I let it sit for over a week after we went hunting on a thousand acre piece and I went on this one property, took a guy and uh, totally ran out. We we pushed it back to a certain point and then we just walked back and brought the trailer down and picked it up and hunted out of the vehicle for the rest of the night. And again, vehicles are just so hard to hunt out of because 
you got lights on, you got, you can't turn the lights off, you know, especially the newer vehicles. Like there's no way to turn any lights off on them. Even my, my expedition, I can't turn the lights off on them. When I hit unlock, the lights are on. It's like so hard, but that golf cart, the first thing I did to it, whenever I got it was I put a toggle switch to eliminate the reverse backup alarm and we just run with the lights off. So such a game changer. Not only that, if you're hauling game out of a field, I've been in fields with it before. I've been in fresh plowed fields with it before. Um, I've been on muddy in muddy fields with it before. And generally I'm not going to say it's going to go through the baddest mud holes, but I've never really had it stuck to where I had to pull it out with a vehicle. We could, we could always were able to push it out, you know, get off of it and push it out while, you know, while doing it while driving. Um, so, and even in, in plowed fields, like it will totally go across a plowed field, no problem. Um, farm fields, you know, with, with uh, crops planted, you can generally get across those without destroying everything. Obviously, uh, if it's short enough, if it's tall enough, then you have to kind of go around and do a different, you know, do different stuff. But I never want to destroy a farm field when I'm trying to protect it, you know. But um, the golf cart, definitely total game changer. And, you know, one of my things with the whole golf cart thing is, you know, 25 miles is not a not a long not very long uh four wheel drive on a golf cart would definitely be really cool there's a couple of different ones right now that have four wheel drive and i'm looking for the best cart on that you know on the on that whole tip with lithium i'm just you know like ultimately a golf four wheel drive cart that could go 100 miles would be ideal um that way you could take it away for the weekend you can drive around and bring it back and still be in good shape uh, without having to charge it if you didn't have access to power. So, but wrapping up the, the you know, the, the gear, a uh, couple other things that I carry. Um, I carry a headlamp just in case I need to look for something, look for blood, whatever. Um, I have a cheap Chinese, super bright, like, cob led headlamp that i use sometimes and then i have a small headlamp that i use as well um also big big deal for me everywhere we go i'm always pulling out my little wind detector and spraying up in the wind just to see you know which way the wind's blowing the other night i was out pig hunting and i pulled up to the end of a road and tried to walk up on a pig that was at a feeder i could hear him there and the wind was totally swirling. I mean, at first it was hit me in the face. And then whenever I got there, it was hit me in the back of the neck. So, you know, wind is definitely a huge deal. And by the time I got up to where that pig was, he must have smelled me or heard me because he took off. So um, that's definitely going to be a big deal. And then uh, the last thing that I carry, like to carry, I always, I always try to carry extra magazine with extra, I, I bring extra bullets too. So I carry an extra load magazine and extra bullets in case I ever have to load. And then the last thing is a game drag. Um, sometimes, actually, I'll, I'll talk about that. So game drag is just a pair, piece of paracord with a handle on it with uh, two loops so you can cinch and put it around a coyote's leg or even a pig's leg and drag them. Um, the reason that Number one, I mean, we, we drag pigs out when we shoot them, drag them out of the woods because it's deer woods and we don't want to leave stinky, a stinky dead, you know, pig next to a feeder. So I actually used it the other day to, I tied it around the golf cart and drug them all the way out and put them on the, in a spot where it wasn't a big deal. But also for the coyotes, a lot of the coyotes that we shoot on this one property have a lot of mange and I really don't want that on my skin. Um, so we will go ahead and, you know, if we have to drag them anywhere, we'll just put that around them and drag them. But something I, that, that, you know, really wanted me to get the game drag or not really touch a lot of coyotes with my bare hands. Uh, I read this Facebook post one time where this guy 
got some kind of flesh eating bacteria or, or some kind of bacteria that was really hard to get rid of from touching a coyote that had something on them. So I just like to, you know, use what I can to drag them out. If I, if, you know, I don't, I really don't like to touch them that much. Um, you know, but here in Florida, we're not really, you know, skinning them out and doing anything with the pelts because a lot of them got mange and it's just, they just don't have good pelts here. I'm not saying that all of them, all of them don't because definitely killed some black ones that like, if I get another black one, I'm definitely going to get the pelt for it. Um, and I've definitely seen a couple that we've killed in the last year that were really decent pelts, but generally we're not saving them. So they're just, they're, you know, they're, we're, we're, we're chasing them around the cows. They're, they're messing with the cows, the calves, and we're just trying to get rid of them for the farmer. So that's pretty much it for the, for the game stuff though, for as far as the gear, um, you know, as far as this podcast goes, um, you know, in the last week, I wanted to talk about, you know, what's happening right now. Um, right now for me, I'm running the AGM Rattler. It's a 1.5 power version of that 384 core. And I'm running that. Um, I just got in the AGM Adder, which is a three power uh, traditional style scope. I'm going to do an unboxing video here after I get done with this podcast and uh, mount it up and uh, do some content with that as well. Um, but as far as the last week goes, like I said, we went and hunted that thousand acre property for the first time last week and ended up killing one coyote. And then last night I went out and I am running the Rattler. Um, the Rattler has had a little bit of issue with the firmware they just created a whole new user interface in the firmware not a whole new one but they definitely expanded the user interface and give you more um, choices as far as the adjustability on the brightness and contrast and also on the the profiles and giving you more you know options on the profiles well when so when shot show came out i did the first update there and the update didn't take it put a log in the in the top folder and which means it didn't take so then two weeks later they finally updated the they put the newest update out and uh, I put that in last week I went ahead and updated it it totally changed everything but the night that I did it um Basically, I had four zeros in that scope, four different bullets on that on the on the gun that I'm shooting it with. And the night that I did it, I looked through and they were still there. And then Thursday night, whenever we went out hunting, I looked again and they were all gone. So I don't know what exactly happened there. I put one in that I had and I put some bullets in that I had plenty of bullets of and we went and I didn't even end up shooting that night. But then last night I went out and shot at a pig and it was probably at 50 or 60 yards and it was freehand. And whenever I shot, I shot right here at the bottom of the neck and whenever it hit, it hit low. So the fact that it lost my zero, um, you know, kind of bothers me. I'm actually going to do a video on that as well. Just some of the experiences that I'm having with the, the Rattler. I mean, it's a great little scope. Don't get me wrong, but there's some things that I would do different or that I, that I want to share that I would do different if I was anybody else, because I'm learning the hard way on some of this stuff. You know, I took the scope off a couple of times and using it as a monocular or whatever. And then whenever I put it back on, I didn't take a picture of where the scope actually was on my gun and whenever I put it back on, it was definitely off on the zero. And then, you know, this happens with the actual losing all my zeros, which I always recommend to write them down. And I did that, but now I just need to go check it because it doesn't seem like it's right. So, and it could have been me. I'm not a very good shot freehand. Um, so, and I didn't bring my tripod last night like an idiot. 
So it could have been me, but I'm definitely going to check that zero. I'm going to check all those bullets again. If they're off, I'm going to fix them. And then I'm just going to leave it alone. And hopefully I can do some damage with that because it's definitely my go-to uh, rifle. So, uh, but that's pretty much, you know, all that's happened in the last week. Um, Thursday night, we got one coyote. And then last night I shot at a pig and missed. But um, the next week coming up, the weekend, I got some stuff planned with the wife. So got to keep that, always got to keep that rolling. Um, so I'll probably end up going out Thursday night if I can get my zeros checked. And uh, hopefully I'll have some stuff to report for next week. If not, you know, I have so many properties I need to get on. And uh, even where the pigs were last night, they were back there again tonight. And, uh, you know, I'm supposed to be trying to keep those down as well. So, you know, definitely um, just going to keep on pushing. And uh, and that's pretty much it. So that's where we're at right now with that. It's been about 40, 40 minutes or so for this thing. So we're going to wrap it up here shortly. A um, couple other things I want to talk about before we do, though. Uh, definitely this podcast is going to keep on going every week. There's going to be a, a point where I'm going to be out of town. I'm actually going out of town um, in about a month to go to Tennessee. So I'm going to try to work something out there where I can maybe find a local where I'm at, and maybe to try to go on a hunt or something so I can do some stuff, but I'm definitely going to be doing the podcast remotely in Tennessee. So not sure what that's going to happen. Also, this is the third episode. Uh, hopefully by the fifth episode, I want to maybe throw an interview in. I want to start doing some interviews on some people that are just totally crushing it. Um, also, there's lots of good gear stuff that we can do interviews with and stuff like that. So if you have any suggestions on that or anything that you want me to try to pursue on an interview side, uh, feel free to drop a comment below. and. Um, that's what we're going to try to do there. And then also got some other thing that I'm really working on that I'm going to be dropping soon. Something that uh, never done before, something that's going to be really cool. Um, targeting the night hunter, especially beginner night hunters. And uh, so stay tuned for that. Um, don't forget, check out, you know, with the if, if you're looking for any of this gear stuff um perceptivegear.com we sell night vision and thermal scopes on there and some other stuff batteries stuff like that um don't have any try oh i got one tripod on there now like one brand that i'm selling on there i need to get some bogs in but um so check that out got some shirts and stuff on there and some hats and uh that's gonna wrap up this podcast so thanks for uh checking this out and uh I guess, you know, if you like the podcast so far, or if even if I suck, just, you know, drop a thumbs up or a thumbs down doesn't really matter to me. I know in the beginning that this is, uh, it's going to get better as I go. So I'm just putting in the work. So, um, but if you uh, want to catch next week's episode or catch, you know, the, the next episode, go ahead and subscribe and uh, we will see you on the next episode.